um, yeah, we're going to continue on our series in distinctions this week. And uh, this Sunday, we're going to be looking at the idea of work and purpose. And you may be asking yourself, well, where's the distinction in that? Well, uh, it has to do with purpose. Are we here to do something or are we here to enjoy doing nothing? Is that our life? To put it in another way, is our life a life of direction or is our life a life of one of drifting, unfocused activity that really doesn't matter whatever we do? Whatever comes our way, good enough. Which one is it? And there is, there is a distinction between those two. But in order to answer that, we have to ask the question, is work good? And what is its purpose? What is work's purpose? Is all of our work simply to get more for me, as our society tends to think? Is the end game to get to the point where I can just simply stop working? Tonight, during all of those commercials that we're actually watching the game tonight to see, sorry, I know you guys aren't. The rest of us are just watching the commercials. About one-fifth of all of those commercials, you may not realize this, about one-fifth of all the commercials are going to be retirement commercials, telling you how to make sure you have the best portfolio possible so that you can quit working. Is that the whole point of work? To do enough so that you can stop it? Is that why we're doing it? Is it something that we just simply have to do, some necessary evil that we must endure as a way to provide us with the opportunities to do the things in life that we really do enjoy? Is that the whole purpose of work? Or is there something more? And to really understand all of those questions, to get to the answer of all of those questions, we're going to have to rewind a little bit and look again at what we looked at last week. Last week, we looked at the importance of the status that God has provided humanity. As we looked at the end of chapter 1, we saw that God created humanity, all human beings, in his image. And we said that the purpose of the image in us is so that life would flourish as we represented God to creation. So the more that we reflect him, the more his creation would flourish. And to put this into the subject of this week, in its most basic understanding, our work is to bring about flourishing. That's the purpose of our work, to bring about flourishing. So pick up in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and, every, uh, and over every thing, living thing that moves on the face of the earth. So right there, we see a reason for the creation of man. And the purpose of that work that God would have given to human or does give to humanity. It is dominion. That's an interesting word, isn't it? And what that implies to us is that the earth doesn't own man. Man owns the earth. At least that's a part of what dominion means. It means there's supreme ownership over something. And not a, I can do whatever I want with this because I own it kind of thing but an ownership with responsibility, like a monarch over a country, that's dominion. There's responsibility to the country as much as the country is mine. So what is the purpose of that? That's what we have to ask. What's the purpose of us having dominion? And this is what we said last week, so that the glory of God could be displayed throughout all of creation. As humanity flourishes on the face of the earth, their dominion was intended, at least partly, to display the sovereignty of God. That's what it is to have dominion. Partly to display his grace and goodness. That's to make sure that everything else flourishes and thrives. Our work in flourishing, ostensibly, is to help bring an understanding of God in his various parts and his various ways that he has disclosed himself to us to the world. So that's the purpose of all of humanity. That's the, if we want to put it into the church ease, that's the calling of your life. And that's where work comes in. Look at verse 15 of chapter 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. God has placed mankind in a garden. And this is very purposeful. 
He places mankind there in the garden to be the garden's maintenance crew, if you will. And by doing so, God then makes gardening the paradigm and the archetype for all of work. Because Adam was the representative of all mankind, everything that Adam is instructed to do becomes kind of the paradigm for all of mankind as well, the whole human race. So therefore, anything God asked him to do represents anything that he asks us to do as well. So, how does gardening then give us a clear model for our work, for our work life? Well, first of all, you should understand, you should recognize that a a gardener's primary work is to raise the level of the garden. I don't mean like just put in dirt until it's higher. I mean to make it a better quality. The gardener wants the garden to flourish. That's the purpose of gardening. And if a garden inherits an already flourishing garden, then their job is to sustain and maintain it. A garden doesn't destroy the garden. That should be fairly obvious, right? You can't sustain anything if your first effort is, well, I'm just going to rape and pillage it. But the gardener does mess with the garden. And he does so with intentionality in order to bring about a greater flourishing. That's what gardeners do. I want more blooms. I want more fruits out of this garden. You see, a gardener is not a park ranger telling everybody, stay off the grass. We also know, though, that a garden, we don't want to over-romanticize this, right? We also know that a garden will, it will overgrow itself without maintenance, right? We don't want to over-romanticize that because, because a garden does, without us being involved in it, a garden will either flourish to the extent that it becomes this tangled mess that we don't want anything to do with, or it will be starved and die for lack of resources. So for the health of the gardener, or for the garden, the gardener might need to cut out some of the plants, might need to prune them back, might need to dig up plants in order to bring about this overall health in the garden. It might be necessary to rip out certain plants in favor of others. And by the way, God has given us authority to do so. That's what dominion indicates to us. So what I'm suggesting is that Work is all about achieving the best results. Work is all about taking the raw materials that God has handed you, a thriving garden, and making it more thriving, more fruitful, more flourishing. And that's for everyone, everywhere. That's what work is, taking the raw materials and producing more out of them than what you were given. Now, That's great for gardening. How does this work for the rest of us? Well, it works the same, actually. It works the same in the classroom for a teacher as it does for the gardener. The same paradigm is is all there for us. We're taking raw materials and we're configuring them in a different way to produce better results. So God doesn't place Adam in the wilderness to say, keep it wild. That's not what he does, right? God places him in a garden to maintain it and keep it. So as a garden, God had designed it to flourish, not to be left alone. God never intends for his creation to go wild. That was never the intention. Uh, Just let it go. It'll be fine. And that's what's going to happen. What what is going to happen if you let a garden go wild is that, well, vines are going to vine, roots are going to root, and everything's going to spread and become a tangled mess, or everything is going to starve and die off, and there'll be widespread death and destruction. You see, it's precisely because vines grow and roots grow that they need a guiding hand. And this is the task that humanity was given. Work it and keep it. And to do that well, you have to mess with it. You have to develop it. You dig up the soil. You discover what plants work symbiotically. And you bring them closer together. And you learn what plants draw out resources that other plants need. And you move them farther apart. But more than just keeping the plants alive, if you're a good gardener, you're creative. That's what a good gardener is. They're creative in terms of how they put together their garden. And so you might set up plants to create a particular pattern that's pleasing to the eye. Or you might allow easier access to the fruit. 
He may clear away overarching branches so that they don't shade too much. Or maybe you allow them to grow so that there is a place of, of shade within your garden. But you're doing everything so that the garden flourishes. And so that everything else flourishes, including yourself, the gardener, as you enjoy the fruits of your labor. And that is like all the work that we can be involved in. An architect does the best job they can. Oh, I didn't even know you were going to be here. I put in architect before you were even here, Wayne. <laughs> does the best job that they can so that, so that they can enjoy the fruits of their labor. If they were to go into that building, it would be great to know that the building's not going to collapse on you. Right, Wayne? Absolutely. All right? If you're a teacher, you teach the best as you, as you possibly can so that, so that the society will flourish as these young minds participate in it. Engineering, supply chain management, writing, they all take some raw material, and the raw material is different in every case, and they transform it into something that helps humanity flourish, and you benefit as a result. Now, God creates all of these domains, these fields, if you will, of work. Oh, we use that same term today. And he puts, the, it puts us into them creatively, graciously, to rearrange them according to the purpose of causing them to flourish. Richard Mao, the theologian and former president of Fuller Seminary, said that when he reads Genesis 1 and 2, he sees a God of resources, love, personality, community, glory. But God doesn't sit on his resources, says Mao. Instead, the triune God leveraged his resources and created space for a whole universe of beings to share what he had, his, his love and his personality and his community and his glory. Therefore, Mao says, if you see a need where flourishing isn't happening and you risk your resources and leverage your resources to meet that need, to produce a product that creates jobs and makes life better, you're reflecting God. When your work allows others to thrive for their sake, you're reflecting God. 